We'll move on now to the 34th study presentation at the British, British Columbian Camp, 1983. And this is 10 o'clock on our final day together, the sec second Sabbath of the camp meeting. Now we spend, we're spending a little time studying the difference between what Nicodemus thought was a holy life and what in fact is a holy life. And it's very important, of course, to understand these differences um, so we can avoid the mistakes which were made so, so seriously made by ancient Israel. Now last night, for instance, we looked at Galatians, the third chapter in particular, and 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, we saw something of the role of the law in being the schoolmaster to bring us unto Jesus Christ. Now, the moral law, or the Ten Commandments, is eternal in a certain sense. It's always hovering there. And the moment that we in any way begin to depart from the life which Christ has mapped out, and when anything of the old spirit of disobedience begins to arise in our lives again, then that law is instantly there to put his condemning finger upon that element in our lives, which of course is a very, very fortunate thing. So when the Christian finds that um, there, is I there is in him any resistance to God's will, any spirit of uh, disobedience, any desire not to follow where God leads the way, then what does that, what does that indicate to him? It indicates the necessity of coming to the life giver for his cleansing grace to remove that wicked thing and replace it with the spirit of submission found of course in Christ and which is the mark of true holiness. And we know that during the Reformation period that this work must be done again and again as is revealed of course in the experience of the Lord's Supper. Let's turn to page 646, no, 646 I believe it to be, yes, page 646 in the same book, Desire of Ages. And um, in the main paragraph, we find a very clear presentation of this principle of a further cleansing work to be accomplished after the new birth experience. These words, I read now page 646, and the words were, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. These words mean more than bodily cleanliness. Christ is still speaking of the higher cleansing as illustrated by the law. He who came from the bath was clean, but the sandal feet soon became dusty and again needed to be washed. So, Peter and his brethren had been washed in the great fountain open for sin and uncleanness. <clears throat> Christ acknowledged them as his. And this statement makes it very plain, of course, that these men had received the initial washing, which we call the revival experience. Christ acknowledged them as his. They were the children of Jesus Christ, um, born-again Christians and ordained ministers of the gospel. But we're now told that temptation had led them into, into evil uh, and they still needed his cleansing grace. When Jesus girded himself with a towel to wash the dust from their feet, he desired by that very act to wash the alienation, jealousy and pride from their hearts. This was a far more consequence than the washing of their dusty feet. With the spirit they then had, not one of them was prepared for commun communion with Christ. And that does well, with the spirit they then had, not one of them was prepared for communion with Christ until brought into a state of humility and love they were not prepared to partake of the Paschal Supper or to share in the memorial service which Christ was about to institute their hearts must be cleansed pride and self-seeking create dissension and hatred but all this Jesus washed away in washing their feet a change of feeling was brought about looking upon them Jesus could say you are clean now there is union of heart love for one another they had become humble and teachable except Judas each was ready to concede to another the highest place now with subdued and grateful hearts they could receive Christ's words you'll notice of course very plainly that the word spirit is emphasized throughout this paragraph and when Peter and when Peter said to Jesus Christ don't don't just wash my uh, feet but wash my hands and my head 
he just felt he needed to go right back and be rebaptized all over again but Christ said no he who is washed that is who has been truly baptized as a true statement of a true regenerate, regenerative experience does not need to go back and repeat that initial step but needs to recognize the necessity for further cleansings as he moves along the way and as temptation brings out elements of evil which were not previously suspected and of course this is very plainly taught in the study on acceptable confession which you all heard or read or both as the case may be this also emphasizes the point that um, we must very carefully study our reactions to other people's actions because in the great judgment day in the great judgment day it's not the other person's actions against us for which we have to answer but it's our reactions to their actions that are our responsibility so when you find that in a given situation a point of temptation or such like there develops or rises up within you, in you an unchrist like spirit which is condemned by the, the administration of death the law the ten commandment law then when we find such a spirit rising in us in response to a given situation then we are to focus our attention not upon the elements or temptation which caused that thing to arise I didn't say which caused that thing but that thing to arise and there's, there's a very definite difference right that, that the words, I did not say the temptation which caused that thing it doesn't cause that thing it causes that thing to arise and in Mount of Blessing page 60 we there read uh, these words that the season of temptation under which it may be one falls into grievous sin does not create the evil that is revealed but only develops that which was hidden and latent in the heart so therefore temptation does not create sin but rather it only brings to life that which is already there and the work of cleansing has not yet been completed by any means there's still work to be done so there is a role for the Ten Commandment law even after we have been converted it is there to restrain or curb first of all any unchrist like spirit which may arise and secondly of course to drive us again to the life giver for, the, for his cleansing grace and removal of that wretched thing and when people will recognize that their most important responsibility is to ensure their own spiritual cleanliness and to maintain their own personal walk with God then they will they will certainly make sure steps of receiving this cleansing grace to take these things away and replace them with the grace of Jesus Christ now this ministration of death which is a glorious thing because of what it accomplishes for us of course it's not so glorious as the ministration of the spirit as Paul says in Romans chapter I mean 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 7 to about 11 <clears throat> has been very very skillfully misapplied by the enemy of souls and uh, the natural tendency on the part of people is to strive to keep all the commandments as written upon those two tables of stone without their experiencing first of all the basic cleansing of the old evil nature and the replacement of it by the new now for instance you've often seen a situation where in a church behind the preacher up on the wall is, is painted the Ten Commandments have you seen a church like that? Yeah. it was quite very common quite a few years ago not so common today and that is held up before the people as the object of their imitation they, they're told that is the ideal strive to bring your life into exact harmony with that law in other words let that law be the model upon which you fix your gaze from day to day now there could not be a worse teaching yeah. remember the sister wife said to the Adventist folk that they had preached the law until they were as dry as the hills of Gilboa without June or rain that law is administration of death and is not the pattern for us to follow not by any means at all we don't want to be stony hearted people upon which the law is written if you go back to the time when God first of all gave those two tables of stone first of all he made them and what was then on them nothing nothing at all they were just two tables of stone then he wrote on them the words of the law 
and then Moses took them down and broke them on the way down the mountainside now first of all the bare tables of stone and then the tables with the law written upon them are pictures of two different kinds of people now for instance if you think in terms of the average person out there in the world today who pays no heed to God's commandments who does not respect uh, God's requirements in any sense of the word at all now are they stony hearted people they certainly are but there are stony hearted people upon whom the law is not written they're just empty of that law reminding us of course the words of Paul when he says I was alive without the law once Romans chapter 7 so likewise when God first of all prepared those tables of stone he prepared a picture of people who did not know the requirements of his law or, or of his character and yet were still stony hearted by virtue of their life of wickedness and sin and then when God wrote the words of the law upon those tables of stone he then painted the picture of Israel who had a knowledge of that law but still were stony hearted in themselves and of course in that condition they certainly could not obey even those commandments despite that fact they said to God very solemnly and very sincerely all that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient but because stone cannot produce righteousness or any kind of plant life it wasn't very long before they bowed down before the golden calf and broke the very law which they had said they would keep faithfully and truly till the end and this led them to realize of course their need of a saviour their need of new natures their need of a transformation and that uh, transformation was affected in, in at least some of them it is not the Ten Commandments of the Lord which is the model of our behaviour Jesus Christ he is the pattern right he is the pattern and his life was not a punctilious um, effort to refrain from doing wrong but it was the outflowing of a life designed to do good it was a very productive fruitful life in Romans chapter 7 verses, well, verse 4 Paul there says we, sh we should be married to another even to him who is raised the dead for what purpose? that we might bring forth fruit unto God now as I said to you I think yesterday if you visit the lo local cemetery you'll find it uh, filled with people who are keeping the Ten Commandment Law to perfection the Ten Commandment Law says thou shalt not steal are they stealing? no they're not thou shalt not kill are they killing anybody? no it says they shall not work upon the seventh day of the week are they working on the seventh day of the week <coughs> you might go through all the ten commandments and find that every dead body in the grave is faithfully keeping every one of those ten commandments by refraining from doing what the law condemns now does God want a universe full of dead people in their graves no, no he doesn't he wants living people productive and fruitful people from whom they pours they continually pours a wonderful stream of righteousness so then when Nicodemus came to Jesus Christ and we'll go back to page 172 now in the book Desire of Ages when Nicodemus came to Jesus he came there as a person who had devoted himself to conforming his life to the requirements of the law he was stony hearted because he didn't understand the new birth experience and Jesus Christ said to him in effect and in fact your very first need your predominant need is to experience a transformation in your nature to become a new man in the place of the old man which you presently are and if we read, read on page 171 in regard to this the figure of the new birth which Jesus had used was not wholly unfamiliar to Nicodemus converts from heathenism to the faith of Israel were often compared to children just born therefore he must have perceived that the words of Christ were not to be taken in a literal sense but by virtue of his birth as an Israelite he regarded himself as sure of a place in the kingdom of God he felt that he needed no change note those words he felt that he needed no change hence he surprised at the Saviour's words he was irritated by their close application to himself the pride of the Pharisee was struggling against the honest desire of the seeker after truth he wondered that Christ should speak to him as he did not respecting his position as ruler in Israel and back in those days of course the expression newborn was applied to converts from hedonism 
and the Jews are very ardent proselytizers of their religion and they had many many converts from the Greeks and the Romans and so forth who became members of the Jewish organization and so they used the word new birth and Christ also used the word new birth but the Jewish mind had a very different understanding of that word from, from the way in which Christ used it that particular uh, evening now today do we find the word new birth as a commonly used word amongst the churches all around yeah. well it is really yeah, it is really they use the word very commonly but is the, ex is the experience a common thing in the churches all around no it's not now <clears throat> new born <laughs> that's right Jim and Carter claim to be a born again Christian <laughs> and then again we see there was somebody else too like, recently who claimed that some governor or somebody I think in the states and um, now what in the mind of the average person constitutes new birth nothing more nor less than a change first of all in your theological loyalties whereas previously you had uh, subscribed to the world and its ways now you subscribe to certain theological tenets and so forth and along with that there's a change of external habits not internal nature but external habits you join a church you become very enthusiastic for religion you become a strong supporter of that religion you become a proselytizer of that religion and this they say constitutes new birth all that's happened is that the old man has taken a new direction he's put on some sanctimonious garments he's wrapped a um, some holy rags around these filthy rags and inside of course he's no better off than he was before and as you know perfectly well if you put clean clothes over dirty ones the stink of the dirty ones usually comes out to the clean ones before too long doesn't it and likewise under pressure the so-called born-again Christian exhibits that the old nature has not really gone but is still there in fact in the um, original copy of the um, what was it called now um, it's forgotten now what it was called uh, anyway, anyway in early writings Sister White's first vision lacks a little bit of what was originally in, the, in this vision and in the complete version it says that some had wrapped around themselves a religious garb but if their hearts could be seen they would appear just as wicked as ever and this was designed to deceive and draw back the people of God now <clears throat> it is a very very common reaction on the part of human beings to say well now if the breaking of the law causes me all this trouble the keeping of the law is going to restore what I have lost that's a very common reaction and people then devote themselves to law keeping as a supposed way back to God whereas of course the only way back is to receive life from Jesus Christ <clears throat> just a little further down on page 171 now we'll read further surprised out of his self possession he answered Christ in words full of irony how can a man be born when he is old like many others when cutting tooth is brought home to the conscience he revealed the fact that the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God there is in him nothing that responds to spiritual things for spiritual things are spiritually discerned but the saviour did not need argument with arguments raising his hand with solemn quiet dignity he pressed the truth home with greater assurance verily verily I say unto you except the man be born of water and of the spirit he, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God Nicodemus knew that Christ here referred to water baptism and the renewing of the heart by the Spirit of God he was convinced that he was in the presence of the one whom John the Baptist had foretold and so conviction begins to fix itself now upon this person's mind Now we said a moment ago that the false version of the new birth is is nothing more than a mental acceptance of new ideas and, and ideologies and of course people can change we find that Roman Catholics become communists and um, others become something else and they have a new set of standards a new set of uh, ideals that they try out and, as uh, a change from what they knew before and likewise people will join a church and have new values and standards and uh, so forth without being changed within the true new birth indicates the beginning of a new life altogether because new birth uh, whenever a, 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 another birth takes place a new life begins isn't that right it is not 
simply the redirection of an old life but the beginning of a new life altogether and every time a baby is born we say a new life has begun and that, and that newborn babe is not as, as the Hindus teach a reincarnation of some previous life now taking a different direction but it's a life which has never existed before right and so likewise the newborn Christian has in him a life which in him has never been there before it is not the redirection of what was previously in that person as Dan put in the next paragraph we read we read it last night the last four lines the Christian's life is not a modification or improvement of the old but a transformation of nature there is a death to self and sin and a new life altogether this change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit now in the scriptures of course that thought is brought to view again and again and again 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 reads if any man be in Christ then what is he? he is a <coughs> new creation all things have passed away behold all things have become new and Christ said to the Pharisees in John 10 verse 39 no, 5 verse 39 and 14 you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me the next verse says and you would not come to me that you might have life uh, John 5 verse 39 and 14 so life is in Jesus Christ and the Christian life is the beginning of a new life altogether you know something it doesn't take any change of character to change from being a communist to a Catholic a Catholic to Jehovah's Witness a Jehovah's Witness to a Seventh-day Adventist or vice versa Roman Catholics and communists have the same character as is evidenced by the way in which they treat people they're both oppressors they're both persecutors they're both very very cruel and, uh, and severe on those who don't go along with, um, with what, they, uh, what they believe in but if you want to change from being a Roman Catholic to a true Christian does a change, is a change of character involved very very definitely and anyone who, jo who truly joins this movement message certainly must experience a change of character before you truly become a part of this movement isn't that right? you're just not the person that you, was, that you were before and this was the great lesson of course which Nicodemus had to learn and Christ made it very very plain that unless he was able to um, experience this transformation of nature he certainly could not see much less become a part of the kingdom which Christ had come to establish and in this chapter in regard to Nicodemus so far as our theme is concerned during this week which is the theme on the study of holiness we find a clear cut distinction be being made between that holiness which is born of above or from above and that holiness which springs from man's effort to keep the law in his own strength the Bible does call it righteousness of course one is called righteousness by works or supposed righteousness by works and the other is called the righteousness which is of faith the righteousness which is by works is man's attempt to bring a clean thing out of an unclean it's man's attempt to obey the law in his own strength without receiving the change of nature whereas that righteousness which is from above is that which accepts a new life altogether in the place of the old it is the spirit of our obedience implanted in the person it is not the curbing or restraining or controlling of the spirit of disobedience now finally Christ got through to Nicodemus and he understood the, the message and over the next several years these words worked in his heart more and more until finally he was able to understand them and took his stand at the crucifixion of Christ with the true Christian church well let's pass on now to the next chapter the next chapter is called he must increase and the scripture is found in John the third chapter verses 22 to 36 so we'll turn to the Bible first of all and uh, we'll there read the description as given to us by the inspired apostle John the third chapter beginning with the 22nd verse and this is when a, something of a crisis began to develop in the work of God upon the earth I now read from verse 22 and on after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea 
and there he tarried with them and was and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from above is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received this testimony hath said to his seal that God is true. For he, for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. But these, of course, are the words of John the Baptist in respect to this particular crisis which was before him at this point of time and in this hour of test John's character came through shining and perfect and very very beautiful let's turn now to page 178 in the book Desire of Ages to note the comments on this uh, point in the life of John and Jesus we start with paragraph 1 for a time the Baptist influence over the nation had been greater than that of its rulers, priests or princes. If he had announced himself as the Messiah and raised the revolt against Rome, priests and people would have flocked to his standard. Every consideration that appeals to the ambition of the world's conquerors, Satanists stood ready to urge upon John the Baptist. But with the evidence before him of his power, he had steadfastly refused the splendid bribe. The attention which was fixed upon him, he had directed to another. <clears throat> this, of course, was the same temptation which came to Christ on the mountain, uh, on the mountain top. Namely, of course, the third temptation when Satan offered to him the kingdoms of this world. Now, we're so accustomed to viewing John as a man of total dedication to God's service, a man of complete submission to God's will, that we tend to think that there was no temptation for John at this point of time. But there was a very powerful temptation, no doubt, although I doubt it had reached him too much because of his submission to God's will, because of his recognition of the principle that he had a, that he had a very particular job to do that God had given him a very spe specific mission and that his task therefore was to do exactly what God said, nothing more and nothing less. And he recognized that his work was the preparation for the way of another, that he was not that other person. It was not for him to gather a great army and rule the world. It was not for him to destroy the Roman power. His task was to prepare the way for Jesus Christ and when Christ came, then he was to quietly fade out of the picture and leave the work to Jesus Christ. Now I greatly appreciate the fact that John understood what his position was, right? And he stayed within the limitations of that position. Now what is that? What do we call that kind of a pardon? Submission, Submission right? Submission to God's will. Submission is also obedience. As obedience not, to the, not just to the general terms of the principles of righteousness but to the, the exact command that God has given. Now what God needs of course is for every single Christian in the world today those of us who are facing the last great climactic battle of the ages he, he, he has to have in the church of God today people living, whom he can trust as he could trust John the Baptist. People whom when he gives us a work and that work becomes very successful and in the success of that work there are opportunities for us to exercise power on our own behalf 
then God needs to have people whom he can trust not to turn aside from the limitations of their work but to stay exactly where God has put them to do no more and no less than God has given to them and John the Baptist was that kind of man now we recognize of course that um, John the Baptist was a type or a picture of the people through whom God will finish the work we read that earlier in, in this same book Desire of Ages as we move into the story of John the Baptist two or three days ago now <clears throat> John was very, very much aware, just as Christ was later, that um, his mission had caused a general excitement and enthusiasm and confidence to grip the hearts of tens of thousands of Jews in his day. Furthermore, the time was ripe. The nation was ready for revolt. The nation was ready to rise at the least suggestion to throw off the hated Roman yoke to slaughter Romans by the tens of thousands and to appropriate their wealth and power to themselves. It was an hour of destiny, an hour of opportunity, an hour when John, John had, to say, had but to say the word and an army would be, be behind him in a moment, eager and anxious to go forth and do his bidding. And John, as a, as a statement says here, it was a splendid bribe, a splendid uh, temptation to divert John from his divinely appointed mission so that he might take to himself power and glory and riches upon this earth. Why should he bother about preparing the way for a Messiah when he could have all this glory for himself? So it was quite a temptation, wasn't it? A temptation which every one of us must guard against because in very, very subtle ways, Satan will lead us to use the power we have acquired in preaching the message for even in small things for our own self-advantage. And something we have to very, very carefully and, and, and patiently and and deeply guard against but John of course what would have happened if John had done this would, would the uh, campaign have been successful no it would not the Romans of course just look at this thing from the normal military point of view the Romans were very very well equipped they were the finest soldiers in the world at that time battle experienced and battle hardened and um, the Jews were an, un, um, an untrained and undisciplined rabble and uh, even though they might have outnumbered the Romans by 10 to 1 a well-disciplined, well-armed force can most certainly outclass an undisciplined, untrained force of people who in turn would have, would have had scanty weapons to use against their oppressors so the thing would have failed anyway but um, um, they would have thought of that because they would have said to themselves if, if in the past a few faithful people doing God's will such as Jonathan and his armor bearer could rout a whole army of Philistines then w and, and if Gideon's, Gideon's 600 men could likewise defeat those hundreds of thousands of enemy well then we can do it too with God's power but uh, the difference would have been of course they would not have had God's power because they, they would have been operating by entirely wrong procedures but um, the, the reaction of John to this temptation urged upon him by his disciples is a very beautiful example of the only safe course that God's people can follow now can you think in the Old Testament of another person who really stands out in this regard also a type of Jesus Christ one of my favourite Bible characters his name was Joseph, Joseph precisely Joseph was the one and um, as we mentioned before when Potiphar's wife uh, came to him with her temptation this was not just simply a temptation to indulge lust or, or appetite sexual appetite by, giving, by offering herself to him she was saying to him in effect that, he, uh, that she now rated him as superior to her husband which he was and that uh, he was in a position where all he had to do was to, to reach out and take possession of his master's goods and she was now telling him that, uh, that in her opinion that was the wise thing to do and her presentation of herself to him was her total commitment to supporting him in this usurpation of his master's goods and position and power and so forth. And she would arrange of course for him to be poisoned off or something like that and Joseph then become the new master of all that wealth. And that was a very, very subtle and deep temptation <clears throat> and Joseph was more than able to cope with it just as John the Baptist proved himself able to cope with this temptation too and the, and the lives of these men 
Joseph and John the Baptist and others like them in the Old Testament period, Moses for instance, are lives that deserve our very close and careful study until the principles that govern them become the guiding principles in our lives too. Because there's nothing more dangerous, well, not just dangerous, nothing more fatal than getting out of the place where God has put you, taking, up, taking advantage of the opportunities your position has, has given you, and exalting yourself beyond the place where God has commissioned you, that is the most fatal mistake a person can possibly make. And many, many people, well, everyone who's lost, I suppose, will have made the mistake in some degree or the other. So then, this chapter on John the Baptist's acquiescence to Christ's uh, work, his statement that he must increase and I must decrease, is a very, very beautiful expression of a holy life. A man who was submissive, obedient, trusting and faithful. A man who knew the place where God had put him. A man who knew exactly what his work was and did that work and know nothing more and nothing less. A man whom God could trust to fill his position and a man, therefore, who received tremendous honour of God in consequence. He being, of course, as we know, in heaven at the present time, having been raised up when Jesus was in that special resurrection. Let's read a little further now to see these same, same thoughts being developed in regard to John the Baptist. And let me emphasise the point, of course, that if the same spirit that possessed John the Baptist is also in us, then we will most certainly find ourselves at last in the kingdom. Second paragraph, page 178. Now he saw the tide of popularity turning away from himself to the Saviour. Day by day the crowds about him lessened. When Jesus came from Jerusalem to the region about Jordan, the people flocked to hear him. The number of his disciples increased daily. Many came for baptism, and while Christ himself did not baptise, he sanctioned the administration of the ordinance by his disciples. Thus he set his seal upon the mission of his forerunner. But the disciples of John looked with jealousy upon the growing popularity of Jesus. They stood ready to criticise his work and it was not long before they found occasion. A question arose between them and the Jews as to whether baptism availed to cleanse the soul from sin. They maintained that the baptism of Jesus differed essentially from that of John. Soon they were in dispute with Christ's disciples in regard to the form of words properly used at baptism and finally, as to the right of the latter to baptise at all. Now it's, it's very obvious, of course, that these men, these disciples of John the Baptist, did not share the experience of John himself. They fell far short of that experience, and there's good reason, of course. We observe the fact that John had spent 30 years of solid preparation, but how long had they spent? Less than one year. Because there was, this was no particular fault of theirs, of course, they hadn't heard the call to repentance until John began to preach and it was then that they began to enter into the experience but after one short year they had not shaken off that Jewish tendency or that Jewish fault to place more value upon the form than upon the reality. And so they were more concerned about um, the actual nature of the baptismal form, the actual virtue in baptism itself. They're going to dispute about forms and ceremonies and forgot all about the living spiritual power that is the essential thing. So different of course from Christ's conversation with Nicodemus when he said to that great man unless you get the spiritual experience, unless you are born again, unless the life of Christ is implanted within you, you will never see the kingdom of God. Whereas Nicodemus of course was, was more concerned about talking about uh, the form of the kingdom than he was about the spiritual nature of that wonderful institution that Christ had come to build. Now, let's turn to page 179. The disciples of John came to him with their grievances, saying, Rabbi, or teacher, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. Through these words, Satan brought a temptation upon John. Though John's mission seemed about to close, it was still possible for him to hinder the work of Christ. If he had sympathised with himself and expressed grief or disappointment at being superseded, he would have sown the seeds of dissension, would have encouraged envy and jealousy, and would seriously have impeded the progress of the gospel. Now then, 
Let's talk about usurpation for a moment. Now, what is usurpation? It is when one person takes over the work of another person. Isn't that right? When one person um, ousts from his rightful position the other person and then takes that place to himself. Now, is this what the work of Christ appeared to be? Mm -hmm. right, he was taking John's place. He was drawing people after him. Day by day, John's, John's following was less and less and Christ was more and more. So what did it look like? Did it look like usurpation? Yes. Yes, right. Now, if it looked like it, then why wasn't it usurpation? This is the way it was supposed to be. Right, it was the way it was supposed to be. In other words, what was the specifically assigned mission of John to prepare the way or lay the foundations on which Christ would build the superstructure of his work? So therefore, John's designated work was not to build up a large church organization or movement. His work was to prepare minds and point them to Jesus Christ. So his work was to gather men not to himself but to Jesus Christ. And that was his work then was, was Christ usurping that work? No, he wasn't. Christ was doing the work which he was called upon to do and John was likewise doing the work which he was called upon to do. So therefore, John was, uh, John was not being usurped from his position by the Saviour Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> does it take a, a great deal of submission on the part of human beings to build up the work of another person? It certainly does, doesn't it? That's the most difficult thing that you can call upon a human being to do because we like to build up our own work and to develop that but remember again the mission of the angels up in heaven which we read the other day perhaps I'll just run back and read this statement again because this, this statement has very very wonderfully impressed me and inspired me to, um, to follow the example of those glorious heavenly beings who seem to understand exactly what their work and mission is page 933 volume 7 in the Bible commentary which reads in part that Jesus is in his holy place not in a state of solitude and grandeur but surrounded by 10,000 times 10,000 of heavenly beings who wait to do their master's bidding now those mighty angels could most certainly devote their time and energy to doing something or building up their own kingdoms in one way or the other or their own interests or their own projects but instead they wait to do God's building and they're, and they're totally devoted to building up the kingdom of another namely of course the kingdom of Jesus Christ now that, that, is, that perhaps is not quite so difficult because of the great difference between Christ as the glorious heavenly king of the universe and themselves as the angels but down upon this earth it was a case of John the Baptist the man building up the kingdom of Jesus Christ the man and that, that's not easy is it? That's not easy. Especially when you're there first. You, you have six months or more head starts. You gather a very successful work around you and you become the centre of attention and, uh, and so forth. Then suddenly this other person appears and the drift then goes in his direction. It's not an easy thing for a human being to do. And John demonstrates the greatness of his character. I say again, the greatness of his character by showing his capacity to build up the work of another when that was the task to which he was appointed. And if we can, as I said before, learn to have in ourselves the principles that govern the life of John the Baptist, so if God calls upon us to build up the work of another, we can do it, then we are demonstrating the same quality of life as John the Baptist demonstrated, and truly holy men and women, and are truly growing up to be Philadelphians through whom God will at last finish his work. At that point, our time runs out, so we'll stop and um, continue with our next study period a little later. In the meantime, are there any questions you'd like to ask or observations you'd like to make? It's, to me, John was just simply recognized that he was Christ's public relations officer mm -hmm. and that he was doing the groundwork. Mm -hmm. I, I, in seeing that, you know, a public relations person does not want the center of attention. No, no. And the same with us. Right, right. He, he, he directs it elsewhere. And as long as he continued to have the humble spirit, why would he not have uh, given up that position anyway? 
Well, that was his safeguard, but the temptation would still be there, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be? See? Because Christ was a very humble person, but not without a struggle did he listen to the devil on a matter of temptation. So if he had a struggle to resist that temptation, even a humble person can be tempted because we are, we are humans. And the next paragraph says, for instance, that John had by nature the faults and weaknesses common to humanity. So his earthliness was there, his humanity was there, and therefore the temptation was there. And we'll find the same thing. He could still have up some pride there in what he was doing. Sure. That was, that was an awful possibility. But the life of John was one of the bright spots in history. He didn't blunder like all the rest seemed to do. Mm. Yes, Kathy? Uh, he said it's all exist. Men can do nothing except it be given him from heaven. Right. Uh, well, uh, that's true. I mean, the strength and everything comes from God. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'm just thinking of the work of some preachers uh, some churches which uh, uh, do healing of people and all this. So they do have, uh, I mean, it's, that's more or less allowed by God, right? And, yeah. Uh, it could be taken for it too, couldn't it? Yeah, but, but they do it by the power that, that, that's given from above too, but it's, it's the misappropriation of that power. It's the misdirection of that power. All power comes from God. We have no power apart from Him, right? And um, the unholy person takes the power God gives to him and uses it for his own advantages, whereas the holy person takes the powers God gives to him and uses that power strictly in the service of God and his fellow men. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I think perhaps a, a temptation doesn't have to make good sense. <coughs> it just appeal to the flesh. Right. Uh, if you're slightest bit impulsive, well, the devil can <laughs> the devil can really work on that. Quite true. Quite quite true. In fact, some temptations are quite illogical. For instance, when when Satan said to Eve that God had um, this tree was in the garden. It, it, was, it was a foolish argument because how could the great creator have blundered so badly as to have a tree in the garden yet all the power in the world not to have it there in fact you and I could dig it up so if we could dig it up God could easily have got rid of it couldn't he or well, never had it there in the first case so to suggest that God had, had goofed or made a mistake by having that tree in the garden was illogical quite illogical but he fell for just the same well let's take a break it's now um, 5 to 11 let's take a break till quarter past no, it's 11 o'clock, rather. Hmm. Time sure skips by, doesn't it? Let's take a break till quarter past and we'll come back for our next study period.